makes you think, you know, at what point is the, is the pressure, you know, at a place where you're willing to make the move rather than staying mm-hmm. there. When I asked Jordan Peterson, I said, Jordan, I said, why are you staying in Toronto? So he says, you know, I'm still staying in Toronto because of different reasons. I said, are you staying in Toronto because one day you want to run for prime minister? No, I have no desire. Why don't you want to run? If you think you can, well, no, I think I can do more of an impact doing what I'm doing versus being right. a prime minister. I said, I don't know about that. I said, listen, mm-hmm. philosophers, great, will stick around. But, you know, I think prime minister, presidents, those guys are going to be, you know, somebody that's going to be remembered. Do you think Jordan would make a good PM in Canada if he chose to want to do that? I think he's too honest. I, I've been also asked to run for high office. And so I'll speak for me, but I think it applies to to your question about Jordan. I think all of the qualities that a politician needs to have, duplicity, uh, scamming, cheat, uh, Machiavellianism, I don't think Jordan and I score very highly on those. So I think we would be chewed up in five seconds. Again, I don't want to speak for him, but... For me, I don't think I could function in that ecosystem. And so I think I agree with with Jordan that our voices are probably uh, more influential doing what we do here because the political system will simply squash you into, you know, saying what they want you to say. And I don't think Jordan or myself are willing to play that game. So in other words, we have to uh, uh, put up with what's being given to us in regards to politicians. That's what we have to deal with. So, So maybe we need to stop complaining about corrupt politicians because we... The good people don't want to run. Is that the right solution? Well, well, that and, kind as, of- as, as you remember, uh, you might remember Plato talked about philosopher kings, right? That democracy was mm-hmm. too important mm-hmm. to be given to the common person. You needed the philosophers to run things. And so that's, I think, what you're talking about. It should be someone like Jordan Peterson who's running the country. But regrettably, in today's world, people like Jordan Peterson uh, are too honest mm-hmm. to succeed in such a parasitic world. And by the way, I remember that conversation right here a few months ago. You... You, you asked that question multiple times. So have you considered, and then you revisited? What yeah, you but you think? know why, though? You know yeah. why I'm asking that question? Because if, if, you, if, if the people that the people wouldn't mind running don't run, then you lose the right to complain about the corrupt right. people who do. Yeah. So you don't have the right to complain about it. Because I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. So, so we're sitting there saying, so, okay, look at these guys. They're You're all saying do something about it. Yeah, no, it's it's... Either run and create some real change in policies Mm -hmm. or don't run and stop complaining about the people that are corrupt and just say Justin's a great guy. Okay, and he's the best guy that we got today. But you to me, I may be wrong. You can't do both. But see, you you, you can't sit there. Now, listen, I'll give you the uh, flip side of it as well. The other side of it for me would be the following. Here's the flip side of it. If Jordan Peterson, or I'm just, in this situation, we're just using Jordan, but pick anybody, you know, whoever that uh, uh, has that kind of influence, right? Mm-hmm. If a Jordan Peterson esque type of an individual said, "No, I'm not running," no problem. Why don't you create an academy and go work with the current 25 year olds and prepare them for the next year, 10 years? So they can run for office and teach them all the Machiavellian stuff that they're going to go through, have them read Prince, have them read 40 Laws of Power, have them read all the stuff that's going to happen, and then give them strategies, challenge them, push them, put them against each other, pin them against each other, give them a topic to play for it, against it, argue against it, something they believe in, but argue how the other person would argue against it, and then try to find the leaks, and here's Liz, and look at this article, look how this person handled this debate, then shape their mindsets 10 years from now, so then in 10 years, mm-hmm. you got a roster of 20 right. people that can run. But to me, it's one of the two. Didn't it, you say Obama did something like that? You, I remember I you saw a Chicago story about- I was speaking at Ritz Carlton. Exactly. 2,000 African-American kids in their early 20s. Good looking men. Like I'm talking, and the way they spoke, I'm like, you sound like you could run. You said they were sharp. Everybody dressed, was sharp. So I go into sneak peek. I'm like, oh my God. Fire. Imagine 2,000 Barack Obamas and Michelle in the room. Mm-hmm. And I said, what's going on here? So, well, this is uh, uh, Michelle and Brock are going to be here. This is an organization that's helping uh, develop the next African-American leaders that may one day become uh, uh, leaders of the free world and presidents. But they were lawyers. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of lawyers in that room. So, you know what I said? I said, good for you. That's what you're supposed to do. Okay. So, there's not a, you know, this whole concept with the Academy, the book that I'm, you know, publishing right now that we're going through. Um, 
it, we the, the the people like that can do such a great job in because there is one thing to do videos and we're glued to the screen and somebody watches oh my god gad you oh wow what a great argument okay so this is a satire approach if you want to go this angle great oh my god look at this jordan peterson great but then there is all right come into the room close the door get rid of all the cameras leave your phones outside mm-hmm. let's talk here's how you handle this there's difference between that and that. Grooming, what, what, shaping. What, what you're talking about used to be called universities, right? I mean, <laughs> right? I mean, yeah. the, the way we train people in critical thinking and in debate skills and in evidence-based decision making, we used to be called a university. And in a sense, that's what I've been railing against for the past, you know, almost 30 years. We had these institutions, right? And you know, what, when I first started my career. I'm not sure if we discussed this when I first came on your show remotely. So what I do is I apply evolutionary biology and evolutionary psychology to study human behavior, right? Well, when I saw how social scientists would respond to my work where they didn't like the fact that I'm applying biology, right? Biology was great to explain the behavior of the mosquito and the zebra and the dog. But what do you mean you're applying biology to explain consumer behavior? What are you, some kind of Nazi? And so that's when I first was exposed to this idea that even very educated people, my fellow professors, could be parasitized by stupidity. And so that really was the genesis of how I eventually wrote The Parasitic Mind, because originally it started in my scientific career where I would see these incredibly brilliant people who would completely lose it at what I thought was a terribly banal point, which is, of course, humans are driven by their hormones, by their physiology. I mean, who doesn't think that that's feasible? But yet in the social sciences, we have erected these edifices of of, uh, of knowledge for the past hundred years, completely devoid of any biology. So you could study anthropology, sociology, economics, you could be in the business school where I'm housed, and the word biology is never mentioned once. But how could you study things like economic decision-making, employee psychology, employer psychology, consumer psychology, without ever mentioning biology? So, you know, the, the things that you're hoping for, the academy that you're looking for, used to be called the university and i'm hoping that we will return regain the power of the university because we've truly lost it i i i um i don't i don't know i don't know if it's going to go back to that uh but i i think what could happen a lot is if individual academies are created yeah i think if individual academies are created and th- by, by the way that's when uh, uh, you you go you'll go and talk to like let's just say the Syrian community. I'm a Syrian, right? We're talking. Your wife is Armenian. I'm Armenian, so we're talking Armenian. And I like how your wife was translating everything I was saying. She's like, "This is what he means. He just said this. His mother is Armenian. His dad's a Syrian." Please go ahead, tell the people how beautiful she is. Go ahead. No, you listen. You you're you're a very good looking guy, and I told you that you look like you're Omar Sharif type of or, you know guy that's got to be in Hollywood. Your wife's dropped it gorgeous. She's beautiful. Thank so you. good for you. Congratulations. Uh, on you. you guys that, look beautiful together. By the way, together. that uh, that was your birthday gift, sweetie, from last week. <laughs> you just you just got a huge shout out from Patrick <laughs> but David. That's your gift. She's beautiful. It was great meeting her. No, but so so you're sitting there and you're thinking like this whole thing with Academy, right? And you're saying, okay, what if what if you know she's Assyrian, you know Armenian? Where they're talking, to, I'm talking to these Assyrian folks and they run a church or they run the club, the Syrian community. And we'll go in there and you'll all of a sudden see like, no, well, you guys are kids and you don't know what you're talking about. Listen, why don't you create an academy and develop the next leaders that are coming up and, and teach them history, ritual, teach them stuff that work, teach them the 50 biggest mistakes Assyrians made and what we can do to learn from it, right? Hey, what are the biggest mistakes a candidate has made, a Republican candidate, a Democratic candidate? I don't know if that's taking place where those leaders are being developed. Like I, I asked, uh, 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 is not not Hillsdale College? It is Hillsdale College, yeah. but you, you got Heritage Foundation, you got Hillsdale College, yep. you got some of these places that are out there. Okay, what are you doing to develop the next guys that are coming up? Okay, Charlie Kirk is doing Turning Point USA, and it's growing, fantastic. Yep. But I'm more talking about doors closed. You know, I've developed leaders, but I've given tens of thousands of speeches in the last twenty years. Take any of those speeches that I've given and then ask who I've built the most. It was a lot of small group setting, one-on-one, mm. one-on-five, one and ten, one and twenty, where it's like sitting there going, that's where real development is made. So if you don't want to run for prime minister, no problem. Why don't we create an academy 
where you take the next 50, 100 guys that are out there and every year create a one-week camp, kind of like how Michael Jordan does his one-week camp. Mm -hmm. Kyrie Irving's got his – all these basketball players have their own camps that you go to. Every summer. Yeah, great. Why don't you create a two-week camp every summer? I guarantee you there's parents out there that would spend the $5,000, $10,000 for their kids to spend time with you. And maybe there's going to be an element of here's $5,000, $10,000. I'm going to send my kid to be with you for two weeks. But it's going to be all day, every day. And then if the parents want to also be there, that's another $5,000 for the parents. They sit all the way in the back. They're not involved. So your kids are in the front. You see the curriculum, so you know how to follow up with your kids. But you're in the back. There's a glass or whatever, so you're not getting involved and messing it up. And he's doing whatever he's doing with the kids, pinning them against each other, debate topic. What do you think about this? What do you think about that? Read this. Really, really going through this intense environment. I don't know if that exists today. But if it did exist and it was by people like this, I think it would blow up. And not only blow up, the future leaders would be built coming out of many of these places. Mm -hmm. Can I give a counter argument? Do so. Well, because I'm going to go back to Gad Sad's initial argument is, why would I sit down in a classroom with 30 people when I can go on to a YouTube or a webinar or whatever and get 30,000 people on there? So it kind of comes down to your motivation and how many eyeballs you want. And is the money the... The, the the motivating factor is it is it change is it creating something the, the vision that you want i'm throwing this yeah. to you because you said at the onset of this conversation why would i sit down and do a lecture in a classroom when i could just boom so do for, it on youtube so for me look an academic has to it's a two step process number 1 you have to create knowledge and i do that of course through writing books through writing academic papers but then the second part is disseminating knowledge right i because by the way do you know how much what is the average number of times that an academic paper is cited in the in the academic literature can you guess how much zero the 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 mean number of times meaning that on average Mm -hmm. most academic papers are cited by no one meaning you do all this work and zero people give a shit zero people give a shit exactly (laughs) Now, not all papers. Some papers are cited 10,000 times and that person becomes Few and far between us. I'm just doing the math. Exactly. The average person is producing garbage. And again, I'm not denigrating academia, but academics come in different shades, right? Some are very, very influential. Most do research that's only read by their mom and the reviewer, right? Mm -hmm. And and I've mentioned this story many times before, uh, but it's worth repeating. So in 2017, I had been invited to Stanford Business School. So that's pretty much the mecca of prestige if you know in academia. I was giving a talk on one of my scientific papers and the gentleman who took me out, the, uh, the host is, is a fellow professor. And the night before we went out to dinner. And so at one point he, he asked me, he says, well, you know, I didn't know you were such a, you know, academic celebrity, you hang out with Joe Rogan, you go on Joe Rogan. I said, yeah, you know, it's, it's great. He said, so he says it now, look, with the kind of an air of disgust, the haughty air. He goes, yeah, well, you know, at Stanford, we don't condone that. I said, you don't condone what exactly? He said, well, you know, we don't do research so that it could be sexy enough so that, it could, so that we can talk about it on Joe Rogan. I said, well, I don't do research so I could appear on Joe Rogan, but surely it's better to both do great research mm-hmm. and be able to discuss it on Joe Rogan because now 20 million people will see yeah. it. He goes, yeah, well, we don't, we don't do that at Stanford. So look at the mindset. His mindset was, I only speak to a few of my anointed class colleagues, right? Mm-hmm. I don't speak to the great unwashed, the rubes, right? Whereas for me, an opportunity to come on Pat's show where I can reach millions of people, I'm jumping on that because I don't have that elitism, right? I, I want now, there's kids who are going to be listening to us say, I want to be that next guy. So in a sense, I agree with both of your positions. We can do it intimately with 20 people, but we could also do it with 2 million people on Pat's mm-hmm. show. Well, can you speak to the mindset of the professor? Because I'm going back to this like, coffee task force so i assume it got implemented and there's coffee at your college (laughs) but when you walk into the break room and the coffee room and there's you and a dozen other professors what's the overall sentiment like oh there's the fucking hot shot uh, totally what is that vibe so so the look as you probably know the seven deadly sins include envy as one of the sins Mm -hmm. right we also know from the ten commandments don't covet your uh, your uh, your professor's na- your na- paper, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and so, so envy, regrettably, is it, it? It drives the economy, right? Keeping up with the Joneses, all those assholes next door have that fancy car. I want that fancy yeah. car. So envy is driving me to. So what happens to a lot of my colleagues is it what what's called an ego defensive strategy. They can't go on Pat's show because they're not 
interesting and charismatic enough. Mm -hmm. But they know how to write academic papers in a certain model, in a certain template. They have mastered that ability. But they would love to go on Joe Rogan, but they can't pull it off. Therefore, they'll denigrate those who can do it, right? So I'm a sellout, right? Because if I were really a haughty professor, I would only be publishing in the top academic paper uh, journals. But here's the thing. I do publish in the top academic journals, yeah. so they can't hold that against me. So I do both, but to them, you're a sellout for coming on Pat's show. That's mm -hmm. too vulgar. It's for the masses. What's the phrase, the, those that can't do teach? Yeah, right. right. How, do, how do you process that? Uh, look, uh, I, I, don't, I don't think it's true. I mean, I think it's a bit of a, a misnomer to say that only those who can't do teach mm -hmm. because... Uh, you know, if you study criminal behavior and you're a criminologist, uh, should you have been a corrections officer or a criminal? In order? So there are certain scientific principles that you could apply. So I could teach entrepreneurship even though I may not have been a great entrepreneur myself. So I, I don't necessarily buy that. But it is true that academia, because of the slowness of how things move, breeds a bit of a parasitic uh, culture, a mm -hmm. deadwood culture. So if you like this clip and you want to watch another one, click right here. And if you want to watch the entire podcast, click right here.